Hi, this is Corey Franklin with Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. And tonight we're going to start with Charles Chuck Colson, who died at the age of 81 recently, and he was a special advisor to Richard Nixon, and he was a major figure in the Watergate case. He was actually the first one that went to jail, and ironically, he didn't go to jail specifically for a Watergate-related offense. He went because he obstructed justice in the Pentagon Papers case by defaming Daniel Ellsberg. Charles Colson was especially loyal to Richard Nixon. He'd worked with him since his 1960 campaign, and he was known for two sayings. One saying reportedly was that he said, I'd walk over my grandmother to get Richard Nixon elected. And on his desk in his office, he supposedly had a sign that said, referring to the Hearts and Minds campaign in Vietnam, When you've got them by the balls, their hearts and minds will follow. In any event, here's a report on the death of Charles Colson. Chuck Colson, a former Nixon aide incarcerated over the Watergate scandal, who later became a minister, has died. The waters of Washington are poisoned. Colson was known as Nixon's hatchet man and was once described as the evil genius of an evil administration. In 1974, Colson pleaded guilty to obstruction of justice charges for attempting to defame the defendant in the Pentagon Papers case. He was the first member of the Nixon administration to be jailed for Watergate-related charges and served seven months in a federal prison in Alabama. Colson said the Watergate experience and his time in prison helped transform his priorities. I think back on those days now and realize that God used them to prove to me where the real faith, where the real meaning, where the real purpose in life is. And it's when you're at peace with God, it is not the things on the outside. Here he is in 1974 deciding to plead guilty. I have watched with a very heavy heart the country I love being torn apart by the most divisive and bitter controversy in our nation's history. If this is to be a government of laws and not of men, and those men entrusted with enforcing the laws must be held to account for the natural consequences of their own actions. Not only is it morally right that I plead to this charge, but I fervently hope that this case will serve to prevent similar abuses in the future. Well, for a guy who was a master at dirty tricks during the Nixon administration, he became a religious convert, and although a lot of people, including some Nixon people, scoffed, he stayed pretty true to that till the end of his life. Here he is talking about it. When President Nixon asked me to leave my law firm and Washington and come in and be his special counsel. Uh, The first thing I did was to be certain there'd be no conflicts of interest. I uh, took everything I'd earned as a lawyer, I put it in a blind trust, I told my law partners not to come visit me, and they didn't. Uh, I was certain that I would never be compromised. I was was determined not to be. And I'd been raised this way. I'd been a Marine officer. I'd learned about duty and honor, and I learned about integrity as a Marine. And as a kid growing up in the Depression in tough economic times, my dad was going to school at night, studying to be a lawyer, and I and he was working days, but on the weekends he'd spend some time with me. He said, Chuck, one thing, always tell the truth and never lie. When you work, work as hard as you possibly can no matter what it is. He even used the example of cleaning toilets. He said, doesn't matter what you're doing, do it well. Um, earn your pay. Do a hard day's work for an honest day's pay. Pay your bills. I mean, I was steeped in what we then knew as the Puritan work ethic. And um, being honest, uh, this was a big thing with me. I would get gifts at Christmas time, for example, and I would take them down to the White House switchboard operators, the guys that drove my cars, because I was never going to be compromised. And I was so determined, I ended up going to prison. Why? I think you can be so self-righteous that you don't see what's really going on. You become oblivious to your own insensitivities because you're sure nobody can compromise you. Human beings have the infinite capacity of self-rationalization, and that's exactly what I did. I was in a lot of meetings where there were high stakes, where the President of the United States would say, national security depends on this. Kissinger came in, fulminating one day over some documents that had been stolen, and he said, this is going to compromise all of national security. I can think back on times, I remember when the president, uh, four or five of us in the office, and the president was exploding over something that had gotten out, it was in the hands of the Brookings Institution, and he turned to uh, Bob Holden, he said, Bob, have we got a team in place that can go in and get those documents back? Remember, I've asked you for that. Then I later realized that was a time when I should have stopped and said, wait a minute, Mr. President, think about the consequences of this. But I did not. 
self-righteousness is believing you're so good that you couldn't be compromised. And that's the kind of pride that's fatal and was in my life because I was so sure of myself that I didn't realize how vulnerable I was as every human being is. This is his first meeting with Richard Nixon after Nixon resigned. You also mentioned Henry Ruth, the prosecutor we did a couple of weeks ago who died. I really felt empathetic because I knew what an incredibly difficult thing that was for him to do. Just to stand there and look at people in, in shame. How hard that would be for a man that proud. And I got there and he had had his phlebitis, his leg was elevated. My wife was sitting in the waiting room I figured I'd be with him a half an hour. I was there three hours. I never got to talk about what I wanted to talk about. All he talked about was Watergate. Mistakes we made. His first question to me was, what did you go to prison for, Chuck? I said it was for disseminating derogatory information about Daniel Ellsberg. He said, I told you to do that. I said, yes, I know. <laughs> That's what I went to prison for. Which story I've, I've not told beyond my family, but my wife roars laughing because here I go to prison for the guy for doing what he said, spent seven months in prison and he doesn't even know why I'm there. Uh, but he wasn't himself then either. He, he was really shot after he left office. I didn't apologize to him because basically I was doing exactly what he told me to do. Uh, and I didn't really think I was involved in Watergate and I had given him Turns out, Henry Ruth, the assistant prosecutor, told me I was the only one who had done this. I was the one who had given the right advice. Uh, get rid of the people who did this, hire a special investigator. Technically, I, I left the conspiracy when I did that, but it didn't matter because I'd already pled guilty. But he, I, I realized if he had taken my advice, he might still be president. So I didn't feel like I owed him an apology now. That was Charles Colson, one of the most ruthless of Richard Nixon's aides who became a religious convert. We're going to move on now to Jonathan Frid, who died recently at the age of 87. And you may not know the name Jonathan Frid, but if you were around in the 60s and you watched daytime television, you'll know the name Barnabas Collins. Jonathan Frid played the vampire Barnabas Collins on Dark Shadows, possibly the most famous soap opera character in soap opera history. He was a Canadian actor. He studied at the Yale Drama School, and he was fortunate enough to get the role of the vampire Barnabas Collins on the ABC soap opera Dark Shadows. ABC was the third network. They didn't have the resources of NBC and CBS, so they were doing innovative things. And putting a vampire in a soap opera in the 1960s was innovative. And no one who was around then can forget this theme song that opened up Dark Shadow. That was the spooky opening for the mansion at Collinwood, and here is the first appearance of Jonathan Frid, a.k.a. Barnabas Collins, the vampire. Nobody hangs up a thing around here. Yes? I'd like to see Mrs. Stoddard, if you'd be so kind. Mrs. Stoddard? This is Collinwood, isn't it? Yes. And the mistress here is Mrs. Elizabeth Collins Stoddard, is she not? Yes. Then perhaps you'd do me the courtesy to inform Mrs. Stoddard that her cousin is calling and wishes to pay his respects. Cousin? Yes, her cousin from England. From England? Oh, uh, please, come in. I'd be delighted, thank you. Oh, uh... Uh, would you like to wait in the drawing room? Here yeah, would be fine. Oh, well, uh, I'll, uh, I'll let Mrs. Stoddard know you're here. Oh, madam, if you would, 
you may tell her that it's Barnabas Collins. It's hard to overemphasize how popular Jonathan Frid was as that character. He was as recognized as anybody on television. They actually had a board game about him. Imagine that, a board game about a soap opera vampire. Here he is with Merv Griffin in an interview in 1969 when the show was at the height of its popularity. Uh, this young man, I haven't met him yet, but I certainly know who he is. As most people do. The uh, show called Dark Shadows is a phenomenon in television. It's uh, on in the daytime on ABC, probably one of the highest rated shows of all time in daytime. It's, uh, he plays a 175-year-old vampire. For, it's just caught on so incredibly that there are uh, the Frid girls. I know the whole front of our theater is lined with girls who couldn't get in tonight, and they're out there screaming and yelling, and they'll probably beat us up as we leave for not getting in the seats. But this show has really caught on. Uh, I know in my house, my son runs home to school. We can't pull him away from the set. It's full of vampires and coffins, and it's uh, an incredible hit. And this, of course, is the star of it. He plays Barnabas Collins. Here's Jonathan Frid. Any personal fears about playing the part of Barnabas? Because I remember Arthur knew uh, Bella Lugosi well. I knew him in his last few years, and the part had gotten to him by the end of his life. That's what I understand. Uh, so far, it hasn't uh, grabbed me quite like that. Uh, I had no qualms about getting into the coffin before your well, time. Listen, I'll tell you one thing about my coffin is that it's so ancient because it is an 18th century coffin. He had a great sense of humor. He had a great time with the part. Say his vampire stare at his victims was really him looking at the teleprompter, making sure he knew his lines. Here he is doing a public service commercial for public television, giving away a coffee mug. I chose this mug because, well, I drink coffee all the time. That's right. Coffee. The reason you may never have heard of Jonathan Frid is because the role of Barnabas Collins typecast him, just like George Reeves was typecast by Superman, and he never got to do anything serious after that. He did a lot of direction, some minor stuff, but he retired to Canada, and as he said, he got a nice cozy house from it and three pensions from the States. Hey. Can't do much better than that. Thanks, Barnabas. We're going to close tonight with Lee Von Helm. Lee Von was the drummer for the band. He died recently at the age of 72, and he was the only drummer who could make you cry because he was also one of the only drummers who did vocals. Lee Von grew up in Turkey Scratch, Arkansas, and he migrated up to Canada right after high school, and he found Ronnie Hawkins, who was a blues rock singer in Canada. Yvonne was the only American with the other four Canadian backup singers, Robbie Robertson, Rick Danko, Garth Hudson, and Rich Manuel. And together they put this record out with Ronnie Hawkins. I'll give you 40 days to get back home. I done called up a gypsy woman on the telephone. Great song, but Ronnie Hawkins was a little too wild. They broke up. They migrated to the United States, to Greenwich Village. They were found in Greenwich Village by John Hammond, who hooked them up with Bob Dylan, and they became Bob Dylan's backup band after his motorcycle accident. First, Lee Van Helms didn't get along with Bob Dylan. He didn't like phonies that much. I think he thought Bob Dylan was a little bit of a phony, but they reunited. The guys put together their own music in a home in West Saugerties, New York, called Big Pink. They were the renowned basement tapes. They didn't have a name. They had been called the Hawks, the Crackers, the Canadian Squires. But their album just said the band with the members, and so they decided to call themselves the band. When the music was released, the drumming and singing of Lee Von Helm was featured, and the band and Lee Von Helm became one of the featured acts in rock and roll. Here are a couple of Lee Von Helm's vocals with the band, and notice in a couple of them, he's playing the drums too, and he plays a nice drum. Here is The Weight. Can you tell me where a man might find a man? He just grinned and shook my hand, No was all they said. Take a load off, Fanny. Take a load for free. Take a load off, 
Here he is with the night they drove old Dixie down. Here he is on Cripple Creek. I said, Donut in my tea. I'm going up on Cripple Creek. Now she said, Baby, I spring a leak. But she meant me. I don't have to speak. But she defends me in front of the street. If I ever did see band made great music but just like the Beatles they broke up and they broke up over an internal fight and the internal fight was between Levon Helm and their charismatic flamboyant and great looking guitarist Robbie Robertson. Robbie Robertson was a great guitarist he had great stage presence but Levon Helm felt and I think with good reason that Robbie Robertson took some songwriting credits that the other guys deserved along with him. Robertson took a little too much star power when they did a film about them which I'll talk about in a little while and that sort of broke up the band and to a large extent, that was a tragic event in the lives of several of them, including Rich Manuel, who committed suicide, and Rick Danko, who died too young. A lot of that was about the fight between Levon Helm and Robbie Robertson. These guys had lived together and worked together for a long time, and it was an extremely devastating breakup when that happened. It was the type of thing that Levon Helm, as a country boy, just didn't tolerate. In any event, he did some single work. Here he is singing Bill Monroe's. Bill Monroe's a name that keeps coming up. Blue Moon of Kentucky. A blue moon of Kentucky, you keep on a shining. Levon Helm became an actor and he did a couple of good roles, including the father of Sissy Spacek and Coal Miner's daughter. Where have you been? Dillil took me riding. What? Dillil took me riding. Took you riding. You just run off, didn't pass nobody or nothing. Run off, worry everybody to death. He also had just the right voice to do the narration to introduce Chuck Yeager's supersonic flight in the right stuff. There was a demon that lived in the air. They said whoever challenged him would die. Their controls would freeze up. Their planes would buffet wildly. And they would disintegrate. Demon lived at Mach 1 on the meter, 750 miles an hour, where the air could no longer move out of the way. He lived behind a barrier through which they said no man could ever pass. They called it the sound barrier. That was Levon Helm. He was a great talent, and the band was a great group. One of the best of the rock era. We'll miss him. I want to thank my producer, Sid Tepps. We're going to close tonight with a song from a movie, and the movie was about the last concert the band ever did before they broke up called The Last Waltz. It was done by Martin Scorsese. And I mentioned that one of the things that Levon Helm and Robbie Robertson fought about was Levon Helm felt that Robbie Robertson took a little too much screen time and credit in the last waltz. My verdict, maybe so, but watch it for yourself. Judge, because it is the best rock and roll movie ever made. Here is the closing theme from the last waltz in memory of Levon Helm. Oh.